world news tonight. Rescue extended. New tactics and rescue efforts continue to feed trapped Indian tunnel workers. Momentary relief. Released hostages reunite with families as Israel Hamas truce takes effect. Shock reversed. New Zealand scrapped generation smoking ban to help pay for promised tax cuts. Oscars of Asia. Chinese movies make their comeback at Taiwan's Golden Horse Awards. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening, you are joining us on World News. We begin this week's broadcast in neighbouring India with the latest updates on the collapsed tunnel in Uttarakhand. The fate of 41 Indian workers trapped in a collapsed mountain tunnel hung in the balance today as rescuers began a risky attempt to drill vertically down to try to pull them out. The labourers have been trapped for more than two weeks after a landslide caused the entrance of the tunnel to collapse and become blocked with a wall of concrete, rubble, debris and metal. Two weeks in, a new tactic to rescue 41 workers trapped in a highway tunnel in the Indian Himalayas. Rescuers began drilling vertically on Sunday from the top of the mountain, government officials said, adding it will take about 100 hours. The rescue plan initially involved pushing a pipe wide enough to pull the trapped men out on wheeled stretchers. But that hit a setback on Friday when a heavy drill broke, leaving rescuers reliant on handheld power tools to break through the rock. The construction workers, who come from some of India's poorest states, have been stuck in the three-mile tunnel being built in Uttarakhand state since it caved in on November 12th. They are safe with access to light, oxygen, food, water and medicines, authorities have said. The father of 22-year-old Majit Chowdhury, who is stuck in the tunnel, says he wants his son to change job when he gets out. I want him to stay near me, he says. Authorities have not said what caused the tunnel collapse, but the region is prone to landslides, earthquakes and floods. A panel of experts investigating the disaster has found the tunnel had no emergency exit and was built through a geological fault, according to one of its members speaking on condition of anonymity. The men have been getting cooked food such as lentils, flatbreads and vegetable curry since a larger lifeline pipe was pushed through earlier this week. Over in China, the country's health ministry stated that a surge in respiratory illnesses across China that has drawn the attention of the World Health Organization is caused by the flu and other known pathogens and not by a novel virus. A National Health Commission spokesman said that the reason clusters of respiratory infections are caused by an overlap of common viruses such as the influenza virus, rhinoviruses, the respiratory syncytial virus or RSV, the adenovirus as well as bacteria such as mycoplasma pneumonia, which is a common culprit for respiratory tract infections. The ministry called on local authorities to open more fever clinics and promote vaccinations among children and the elderly as the country grapples with a wave of respiratory illnesses in its first full winter since the removal of COVID-19 restrictions. People were also advised to wear masks and were asked to prevent the spread of illnesses in crowded spaces such as schools and nursing homes. The WHO earlier this week formally requested that China provide information about a potentially worrying spike in respiratory illnesses and clusters of pneumonia in children, as mentioned by several media reports and a global infection disease monitoring service. The emergency of new flu strains or other viruses capable of triggering pandemics typically starts with undiagnosed clusters of respiratory illnesses. Both SARS and COVID-19 were first reported as unusual types of pneumonia. Israel Hamas war updates now. A four-year-old American girl is among 17 hostages released by Hamas yesterday, the latest group in the ongoing ceasefire with Israeli forces. Hamas expressed willingness to extend the four-day truce, but only when Israel agrees to release more Palestinians. And Palestinians are waiting by a border crossing on the Egyptian side seized upon the chance to head back into the Gaza Strip amid the four-day truce, with many eager to go back home to reunite with their families and family friends, despite the dangers which lies ahead. Scenes like these have been unfolding in Israel and the Palestinian territories in recent days. 
as more hostages are let go by Hamas in exchange for the release of more Palestinians in Israeli prisons. This Israeli government video is said to show some of the young families released on Saturday reuniting. And again on Sunday, another group was freed. 17 hostages, including a four-year-old American girl. The temporary truce between Hamas and Israeli forces is allowing more humanitarian aid into Gaza as well, but there's also another effect. It's allowing some Gazans a moment of reflection in the ruins of what was once their home. Reuters journalists found Ibrahim Kaninch in the city of Khan Yunis, near the border with Egypt, feeding bits of cardboard into this fire outside his partially destroyed house. He's making tea. He's saying that gathering around a bonfire like this used to be an Arab tradition, particularly for Palestinians. And although the practice was lost years ago, he muses that the war has brought back some parts of Palestinian heritage. But what's next, he asks. There's no electricity or water. There's shortages of all basic human needs. No house, no shelter, no clothes, food or water. Everything is scarce. Kaninch says the occupation, referring to Israel, can destroy homes but can't destroy their right to a homeland. The war has leveled large parts of northern Gaza, such as this area of Gaza City, and forced hundreds of thousands from their homes. Negotiators from Qatar and Egypt and the United States government are pushing for the ceasefire to extend beyond its Monday deadline. A suspect has been arrested in what police have called the hate-motivated shooting of three college students of Palestinian descent in the U.S. state of Vermont. Burlington police have arrested the 48-year-old suspect identified as Jason J. Eaton. A 48-year-old man was arrested in connection with the shootings of three college students in Palestinian descent in Burlington, Vermont, USA. The Burlington Police Department said in a press release that Jason J. Eaton was detained midday yesterday near the site of the shooting. Police then searched his home and arrested him yesterday evening. The college students had been wounded Saturday night in a shooting in Burlington, the state's most populous city, by a gunman who opened fire at them without speaking. A preliminary investigation by the Burlington Police Department determined that three students, all in their 20s, were shot outside the home of one of the victim's relatives, which they were visiting for the Thanksgiving holiday. Police detectives, county personnel and federal agents spent yesterday canvassing the neighbourhood near the shooting and conducting interviews with neighbours. Officials said that the FBI helped with victim services and computer cell phone analysis. Bulletin officials said that the agents with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives were canvassing near the location of the shooting when they encountered and detained Eaton. Police said that the shooting occurred in front of the apartment building where Eaton lived. After he was detained, officials were granted a search warrant, which was executed at his residence. U.S. election news on the road to the White House next. Former President Donald Trump attended a highly anticipated rivalry football game in South Carolina as he campaigned in the key early nominating state ahead of next year's Republican presidential primary. The Parliament of Ball is an annual matchup between the University of South Carolina and Clemson University. Governor Henry McCaster, a University of South Carolina alumnus, who has endorsed Trump, recently said that the former president had a standing invitation to attend the game. Trump watched the game from a box and went on to the field at halftime with McMaster. The former president briefly stood on the 50-yard line and waved to the crowd, receiving cheers and some boos. Republican Sen Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, who has endorsed Trump, was also in attendance with the former president. Trump, the front-runner for the GOP nomination, maintains a commanding lead over his primary rivals in South Carolina, which found the state's former governor, Nikki Haley, as his strongest challenger, but still a distant second. Haley's campaign did not respond when asked whether the Clemson owner would be attending the game. Welcome back. 
The New Zealand's new government says it plans to scrap the nation's world-leading smoke ban to fund tax cuts. The legislation introduced under the previous Jacinda Aldrin-led government would have banned cigarette sales next year to anyone born after 2008. New Zealand will scrap its generational ban on smoking to help pay for promised tax cuts following an agreement by the country's new three-party coalition government. The ban, which was touted as a world first, had promised to bar future generations of New Zealanders, those aged 14 and under in 2027, from ever purchasing tobacco, as well as drastically cut the number of retailers able to sell such products. New Zealand's National Party sealed the agreement after drawn-out negotiations over ministerial laws and policies including indigenous rights, tax cuts and changes at the central bank. The centre-right nationals, led by the incoming Prime Minister Christopher Luxon, returned to power alongside the populist New Zealand First Party and Libertarian Act New Zealand after six years of rule by governments led by the left-leaning Labour Party. The new government will cut personal income taxes following through on a campaign policy used to woo middle-income voters struggling with rising costs of living. The coalition agreement also outlines other plans including the repeal of a ban on the sale of cigarettes to future generations introduced by the previous Labour government. Documents show the new government will repeal the Smoke-Free Environments and Regulated Products Amendment Act 2022 to remove the requirements of denicotinization and reduction in retail outlets. The National Party and New Zealand's First have also agreed to do away with the laws before March 2024. According to New Zealand arm of British American Tobacco, tobacco products make their largest financial contribution to the country's economy. This comes in the form of excise taxation with the industry paying over 2 billion New Zealand dollars. Next, an update on the chaos in Sierra Leone. The country has arrested most of the leaders of an armed attack in the capital that has prompted the government to declare a national-wide curfew. Gunfire was heard across Sierra Leone's capital on Sunday after assailants attacked a military barracks in the early hours of the morning. The government said security forces had repelled, quote, renegade soldiers who attempted to break into the military armory in Freetown. Gunmen also attacked a police station and a prison, and some prisoners escaped. Hours later, prisoners. President Julius Madabio addressed the nation. The attackers have been repelled by a combined team of gallant security forces, and calm has been restored. Most of the leaders have been arrested. Security operations and investigations are ongoing. We will ensure that those responsible are held accountable through due process. The unrest prompted authorities to impose a nationwide curfew. Tension has been boiling in the West African country since Bio was re-elected in June, a result rejected by the main opposition candidate and questioned by international partners, including the United States and the European Union. In August last year, at least 21 civilians and six police officers were killed in anti-government protests. In his Sunday night address, Bio called on Sierra Leone's political and traditional leaders and civil society to work together to preserve peace. Moving on to the Russia-Ukraine war front. Over the past weekend, both sides have used large-scale drone attacks. Russia launched its most intense drone attack since the start of the war on Ukraine and Kyiv. Kyiv replied with drones and missiles as well. No deaths have yet been reported on either side from the attacks. Ukrainian military reported that Russia launched a total of 75 Iranian-made Shahed drones targeting Ukraine's capital, Kyiv. Of the 75 drones, 74 were destroyed by Ukrainian air defences. At least five civilians, including an 11-year-old child, were injured, according to the mayor of Kyiv. The Russian Ministry of Defense, meanwhile, reported that on Sunday, Russia shot down 24 Ukrainian drones over Moscow, Tula, Kaluga and the surrounding areas. The military also reported of two missiles destroyed over the Sea of Azov and Russian air defenses intercepted 53 Ukrainian drones over the Ukrainian territory under Russian control. On to the devastating floods in Somalia. The number of people killed by floods from heavy rain in Somalia has climbed to 96. 
Death tolls are also expected to increase in the coming days as the East Horn of Africa continues to be battered by heavy rains. The heavy rains in Somalia have taken the lives of almost 100 people, according to state news agency SONA. It said in a post on social media, 96 people had perished, adding the figure was confirmed by the head of the country's disaster management agency. The constant downpours are putting fear into the country's residents, like Hawa Ali Ahmadin. These floods are double compared to the previous ones. You can't take a risk in this one. When it's raining, we sit outside under a tent until the rain slows down. We only come in the house when the rain slows down so that we can cook for the children. Somalia and the rest of the East Horn of Africa have been battered by relentless heavy rains that began in October, caused by El Nino and Indian Ocean Dipole weather phenomena. Both are climate patterns that impact ocean surface temperatures and cause above average rainfall. The flooding has been described as the worst in decades, displacing 700,000 people, according to the United Nations. The intense rains are exacerbating an already existing humanitarian crisis caused by years of insurgency. The head of Somalia's Red Cross, Pascal Kutat, says the worst is not over yet. We have currently a confluence still of the Indian Ocean Dipole of El Nino. We have a cyclone building up uh, in the Indian Ocean. We have rains continuing in the highlands of Ethiopia. All of that means that this is not over and it's not yet at its peak. It's getting worse and these people are, are going to suffer more. In neighbouring Kenya, the floods have so far killed 76 people, according to the Kenyan Red Cross, destroying roads and bridges, as well as leaving many residents without shelter, drinking and food supplies, according to the charity Doctors Without Borders. Welcome back. Pakistan's Lahore has once again topped the daily rankings of the most polluted cities in the world. For more on that story and more, let's take it on the world. Pakistan's second largest city, Lahore, has once again topped the daily ranking of the most polluted cities in the world, leaving authorities scrambling to fight the environmental crisis. According to the South Korean military, North Korea has deployed soldiers and hemp weapons at guard posts near the border with South Korea following the suspension of a military accord between the countries. A cargo ship sank off the Greek island of Lesbos, leaving 13 crew members missing and one was killed. The Raptor, registered in Comoros, was on its way to Istanbul from Alexandria, Egypt, carrying 6,000 tons of salt. Heavy snowfall in Bulgaria has led to the closure of various roads and more than 1,000 homes to go without electricity. Bulgarian meteorological authorities issued a red weather warning, indicating dangerous conditions. Sizzling hot lava steamed down from Italy's snow-covered slopes of Mount Etna. A substantial lava flow was evident in Sicily's skyline, originating from the southeast crater of Europe's tallest and most active volcano. That is all we have for you on World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we bring you updates from across the globe. If you miss any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. Tonight, we are leaving you in Taiwan as film stars descended upon the annual Golden Horse Awards 2023. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.